So part of the mindset that we have, we have absorbed from people around us. So it turns out that at the heart of who we are is where we hold our beliefs. And we have anywhere from 50,000 to 100,000 beliefs that define who we are. The only problem is most of those beliefs we get by the time we're the age of seven. Right. And we pick up those beliefs through osmosis from our parents, our uncles, our aunts, our teachers, the cookie monster. If anybody says something believable, we believe it. And let me give you an example of one of those. You could have a, a beautiful family in San Diego going out to one Saturday morning to go look at new cars. Mm -hmm. And just as they pull up in the lot, mom turns to dad and says, look, honey, if you really like a car, don't let the salesperson know or they'll force you to buy it. And little Sally, who's five in the back seat, kind of hears this and goes, oh, better not trust salespeople. And there's a really good chance she's going to become a salesperson, but she'll reach a certain plateau and won't be able to go past it because that limiting belief from that innocuous comment her mom made when she was five is now as a belief and is holding her hostage. And isn't that fascinating how we end up being the adults we do? from all those beliefs that we had in the past, and most of them are amazing, that give us these lives, and some of them hold us hostage. Like I always say, mm -hmm. exchange criticism for curiosity, right. and you will go far. So when you start becoming very curious about why you think a certain way or why you had a thought, and paying very, very close attention to your feelings, because sometimes the thought won't be as obvious to you because we're so used to having them. They say that you have the, the statistic is we have 60 to 70,000 thoughts a day. 90% of those thoughts are the same thoughts we thought yesterday. So mm -hmm. what's the, the, the lesson there? We're, we're running a program. Only 10% of our thoughts are new, which means there's only 10% chance of us creating something new because we're doing right. the same thing over and over again. We don't know it. So paying very close attention to what triggers you, what in your body feels wrong feels when do you feel anger when do you feel when do you feel a knot in your stomach or just that that feeling of dread we know what that feels like in our body paying really close attention to that because that resistance will clue you into the beliefs that are underneath when i would go with the maasai and wander the maasai mara with them i would watch them i would watch all of them and there's six things that happen to them all at the same time one, they're still. Two, they're alert. Three, they're deeply listening. Four, they're observing from 360. They're curious about anything that is happening in their, their environment. And their intuition is on full, fully. So this is their survival mechanism. Most of us have a hard enough time to do one. And if we bring that back to reflection, that is stillness. But at the same time, being alert to whatever thoughts are coming up or ideas and planning perhaps and jot them down and to be able to do that but it's also listening to your inner voice and and but from a, a perspective of observation and not get so tightly involved with it take a moment to debrief with yourself you know what are those mm -hmm. statements or those catchphrases like i remember for me one of the phrases that really started to derail me and caused me to emotionally and kind of mentally check out during a sales conversation was if someone used the words, I can't afford it. Like I had so much judgment around that and what people meant by that. And it wasn't until I really started to pay attention to my own self-talk during those conversations. And I was like, Nadia, what is that all about? Because <laughs> I've had people say it and then they still purchased, you know? So yeah. it doesn't always mean that they can't afford it. But if I were to always take it at face value and mentally check out, then I would never be able to really get to what's under it. So I agree, taking the time to really pay attention to those emotions and those thoughts and those things that come up, because that's what really can take you out. You have to be very careful about the inputs that you put into your brain, especially first thing in the morning, especially when you're getting ready for a, a job as tough as sales. Like if you're on if you're on news sites and they're just annoying the heck out of you because that's what they're designed to do, um, and they're provoking you, or you're on social media getting upset about, oh look at all these other people seem to be having a great life and I'm not, even though that's not reality either. But I just think you have to be very conscious about the inputs if you're going to set yourself up for success. 
as a sales professional, I am an important business person who does something important that helps people get a specific result that solves a specific problem. And really kind of having that idea of everybody should want to have a conversation with me, not gosh, I hope this person, or gosh, I hope that this goes well, but it's like, no, everyone should want to talk to me. Like we should be so bought in and so sold on what we sell that it's not, well, this person's doing me a favor by having a conversation, but like, I'm doing them a favor. Like I'm really helping them. So when I say sales mindset, John, it's really bringing that attitude of like, you know, almost, uh, you know, just blind excitement and enthusiasm around what we do to our sales conversations, to how we show up on social media, to how we interact with prospects, to how we interact with clients. But when you go below the surface of the water and onto the realm of the beliefs and the subconscious, this is actually where your actions come from. Most people think they can will themselves to create results or to achieve something or to uh, to discipline themselves to do something, but it, it doesn't come from will. Discipline actually comes from the the sub, the, the the subconscious fabric. And I know most people don't talk about this, but they mm-hmm. can discount the subconscious. And when you understand that your habits, that your behaviors, that how you show up in the world, in your business, in, in your, your fitness goals, in your relationships, it always comes down to how you see yourself in the, in the, the, the theater of your mind? Do you see yourself as being a disciplined person? Do you see yourself as somebody who's already reached that goal? Do you believe that it will happen? Do you believe that you can make that, mo- that amount of money? Do you believe that you can close a sale every day? You know, I am a one call closer. I don't need seven calls. I'm a one call closer. When you have that, that belief system, when you, when on the inside, you expect certain results, certain things in your life, subconsciously you take actions towards them. Serving is a skill to connect without your agenda with another human being. Being, You still have your boundaries. You're not giving away two, three hours of your time where, Mm -hmm. right? But perhaps you choose to invest half an hour or an hour because it makes sense in your model and your framework. But when you do that, whatever that may be, you do it from a place of service. You are unattached to outcome, but at the same time, if you recognize there's an opportunity to help them, you ask permission. You know what, John, based on this conversation, I feel highly confident I can help you. Would you Mm -hmm. like to see what that might look like? If you actually look at the original Latin and Greek meaning of the word authentic, um, it actually comes from from the ever changing self or the masterful self, and so you know my philosophy is your your authentic self is your ever growing masterful self. So it's this constant evolution, you know, of really of really who you are. So so by by learning something new and by you know figuring out what that looks like. You, you, that that's what being authentic is. And it's probably mm-hmm. the hardest of the mindsets for me personally, because scarcity is real and tangible. And I personally grew up with financial scarcity. Mm-hmm. Um, and we tend to make decisions based on an anecdote to something that's missing, right? So yeah. that's why I went into finance the first decade of my career. <laughs> um, it was, I wanted that financial security. And so um, when scarcity drives us, we tend to be protective, we tend to be defensive, we tend to be jealous. Um, and, you know, we, we look at everybody as competition. So an abundant mindset is that that switch from not everything's great, but for the possibility that things can be better than they are. And when you said that we're in that comparison, one of the things that I say is don't compare yourself against other people. Track yourself against your individual goals, because there's always somebody who's doing better and there's always somebody who's doing worse. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. But if you are happy with your progress, then you can feel that sense of abundance. 